been talking about the words Jesus spoke from the cross. And they are not His final words. They are His dying words. But they are not His final words because He rose again and He lives to this day. Luke 23, I'm going to read 44 through 46. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light had failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. What would your dying words be? If you were in a moment and you could feel your your heart giving out and the breath of your lungs not, not going right and you had just a little bit of breath left, what would your dying words be? What would you want to go out of this world saying? What would you want the last thing that you said to be? We don't usually think about things like that. We don't like to think about the day of our death or the moment of our death so much. But there are last words that people have spoken, and some of them actually are kind of interesting. I have some on the screen here. We have Caesar Augustus to his subjects. I found Rome of clay. I leave it to you of marble. He kind of had a high view of himself. Marie Antoinette, uh, she was the one who uh, was executed in the guillotine, and uh, on the way up she stepped on her executioner's foot on the way and said, excuse me sir, those were her last words. There was a convicted murderer who used his last words to complain about his last meal. I did not get my SpaghettiOs, I got spaghetti, I want the press to know this. Then there's Karl Marx. Last words are for fools who haven't said enough. Or Bob Marley, musician, money can't buy life. It's the last words that he spoke. Some have had some fun with it. Oscar Wilde said, either that wallpaper goes or I do. Humphrey Bogart said, I should never have switched from scotch to martinis. Groucho Marx was dying and said, this is no way to live. Bob Hope was asked by his wife where he wanted to be buried, and he said, surprise me. And Charlie Chaplin, I think this is interesting, a priest visited him and said to him, may the Lord have mercy on your soul. And he says, why not? After all, it belongs to him. Jesus' dying words, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So these are Jesus' last words before he died. If you look at the four different Gospels, they give different words that he goes out with. Only Luke records these, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So which ones really were the last? Well, I, I wanted to dive in and figure this out. In Matthew and in Mark... Jesus shouts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew and Mark, they talk about his, as we say, descent into hell and the suffering that he endured. So that was his last words in those books. But both both Mark and Matthew say that he cried out again after that. And that was probably what John recorded when Jesus said, It is finished. He cries out, In victory, saying, it is finished. In John 19.30, when Jesus received the sour wine, He said, it is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up His spirit. And then Luke records these. Father, into Your hands I commit My spirit. Now some might look at this and say, well, these are conflicting accounts. You know, maybe that kind of takes away their credibility. But they actually fit together pretty well. Um, Mark and Matthew say that Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he cried out again. 
And that cry again was probably, it is finished, as John records it. But Jesus cries out, it is finished, and then said softly, verse 46 of our passage today, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because when it says calling out here, it actually better is translated after calling out. So he calls out that one more time and then says this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We know Luke was someone who interviewed many people to get many different accounts of what actually happened when he put this together, put his book together. And so he interviewed people who were there. And so that's probably why he's the one who records this and not the other ones. So these are Jesus' dying words. Not His final words, but His dying words. There's some people whose dying words show that they have no idea that death is coming. So, basketball great Pistol Pete Maravich, he was playing a pickup game and he said, I feel great. And those were his last words. And there was a Union general in the Civil War, John Sedgwick, to his men who were ducking from fire of a Confederate sniper. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Those were his last words. And then there's some people whose dying words show a sense of what's coming. They can sense that their time is there. So Benjamin Franklin, to his daughter, when she told him to change position in bed so he can breathe more easily, a dying man can do nothing easy, is what he said. Or there's a playwright, Eugene O'Neill. He was born in a room at uh, the Broadway Hotel and died at age 65 in a Boston hotel. And his words, I knew it, I knew it, born in a hotel room, and darn it, dying in a hotel room. Those were his last words. So some people know it's coming and others don't. Jesus knew it was coming. The Gospels show that Jesus knew his future quite a bit. He had a knowledge of what was coming unlike anybody else did. There were many times that the Gospels say that Jesus told his disciples what was going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of men, wicked people, and I'm going to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and then in three days I'm going to rise again. And that just blew their minds. That didn't make sense to them. What, what are you talking about? And Peter, when he heard this the first time, he had to take Jesus aside. Uh, no, that's not going to happen to you. This, this would never happen to you. But many times Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Not only did he know it, Jesus was fully in control of his death. When it's recorded, the things that happen, it's said many times that Jesus was basically in control of events. It doesn't say it just like that. But... For example, in John, it says he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. His spirit didn't leave him. It wasn't taken from him. It says he gave it up like he chose that moment. Or this one, John 10, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, that I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down by myself. So Jesus was fully in control, even at the very end. Even though He was helpless, even though He was pinned to a cross, and He couldn't physically move, He was still in control. To the very end. And though He was fully in control, Jesus submits to His Father. He was fully in control, but instead of hanging on to that control, He says, into your hands I commit My Spirit. He gives away His control. He doesn't hang on to it. 
Just like he didn't hang on to his divinity in heaven, he let it go. He set it aside to become human. We like to think that we're in control. We like to try to be in control. We like to control people and what's going to happen. We have our plans and we try to make it happen just like we want it to. Sometimes we kind of take more control than what we really can. We kind of play God a little bit with, with people or our circumstances. But really, we are out of control. And the funny thing is, is that Jesus actually was in control to the very end, but He didn't hang on to that control. He let it go. So we, as weak, frail, limited human beings, how much more should we submit our control to God and not try to control every last thing? Some people's dying words are reflections on the life that they lived. So Luciano Pavarotti, who is a famous tenor, said, I believe that a life, a life lived for music is an existence spent wonderfully and this is what I've dedicated my life to. Those were his dying words. Or Errol Flynn, the actor. I've had a heck of a lot of fun and I've enjoyed every minute of it. He died at 50 and was buried with six bottles of whiskey. Jesus' dying words are a summary of his whole life. That Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Those weren't just like a, the last moment for him. Those, those words summarized his whole life. His entire life was given in service to his father. He spent his whole life giving himself to his father's service. His whole life. He didn't live for himself. He lived for his father. He lived for God and he lived to serve others. That was his whole life. He didn't do just a little bit here and there to help others. He didn't do just a little bit here and there to serve God. His whole life was that. John 6.38 For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. John 5.17 Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. I'm working with Him, in other words. Jesus is doing God's work. And He gave Himself to God's work. Think about what else He could have done if He wanted to. If He wanted to use His power for His own advantage. If He wanted to show people who He really was. Think of what other futures He would have had. He could have ruled the world. Easy. Instead, he decided that he's going to take the nature of a servant, he's going to serve people, he's going to do what God wants. He's going to have a very low-key life, and he's going to go out on a cross. Not something that we would have picked, but that's what he picked. It's not often valued on earth, but Jesus lived and died in submission to the Father. He was submissive. He didn't do just what He wanted. He did what His Father wanted. He followed the Holy Spirit who descended on Him when He was baptized in the Jordan. We need to submit ourselves to God too. Instead of thinking what we want all the time or the future that we would like, we need to be ready for a future that God might want, which might not be a future that we would want. Instead of a direction that we might want to go, we might need to be open to a direction that we might not want to go. Some dying words are towards loved ones. So Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories. He turned to his wife and said, you are wonderful. And then he clutched his chest and died. Michael Landon, who's on the Little House in the Prairie, show. His family was gathered around his bed and his son said it was time to move on and Landon said, you're right, it's time. I love you all. 
Or there was a reporter, O.O. McIntyre, to his wife Maybell. He said, Snooks, will you please turn this way? I like to look at your face. And that was his last words. So some dying words are to those we love. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus' dying words are to the one he loved most. It says that his mother was there. It says that he had uh, some disciples there, not the twelve necessarily, but there were some disciples that were there, particularly the women that were following him. He didn't turn to his mom. He didn't say, I love you, mom, or thanks for being my mom, or anything like that. He turned to his heavenly father. He didn't turn to his earthly friend. He didn't say, hey, thanks for following me, or it's been great, it's been wonderful. He turns to his father in heaven and says, into your hands I commit my spirit. We wouldn't and shouldn't just trust anyone with our lives. There's some people who are very unreliable and would take advantage of us. But we can trust God with our lives, even to our deaths, because He's our Father. He's our Father. And He's not just Jesus' Father, He's our Father too. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you can call God your Father. We have all the privileges that He has if you belong to Him. It says in Galatians 4, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave. You are a son. So we are the children of God. We can call God our Father. And God, our Heavenly Father, loves us more than we love ourselves. That's maybe hard to grasp. But He loves us more than we love ourselves. And He has real love for us. Not that fuzzy feeling love. He has real love. He wants what's best for us. And He's willing to push us if need be so that we would reach our full potential and that we would have that best. So in each one of us, there are layers of selfishness where we live for ourselves, seek our own gain. And underneath, there's all this potential for actual growth for actual service, for actual fruit. Things that are eternal. And we wouldn't be willing to break through those layers of selfishness because we don't love ourselves enough for that. We would rather just be comfy and cozy and have things nice and convenient. But God loves us enough that He would find ways to break through that selfishness so that we would actually bear fruit, fruit that lasts, that we would reach our full potential, that we would actually become more like Jesus Christ. We don't love ourselves enough for that, but He loves us more than we love ourselves. Can you trust God even when His plan is opposite of what you want? The cross wasn't exactly something that Jesus was looking forward to. It wasn't exactly His most desirable route to take. He knew He had to take it. But He didn't want to. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, He prayed that there would be another option. Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. If there's any other possibility for me to save the world, complete my mission, please give me that. Because I don't want to go through this. But he didn't stop there. He said, not as I will, but as you will. Then he goes to the disciples, he finds them sleeping, so he goes back to pray again. He says again for the second time, My Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, may your will be done. He was submitting 
to what God wanted, even though it was not what he was looking forward to. Can you obey God even if it costs you everything? There's some people who are meeting for worship right now, and at any time the doors can bust open and everyone could be arrested. And they could lose their jobs, they could lose their homes, they could lose all their possessions, maybe lose their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Would you still obey God even if there was that risk? Jesus died without clothes on his back. He lost every last thing that he owned. And he died in disgrace. If he would have told one lie, just one, he would have been let go. He wouldn't have had to face that. But he didn't tell a lie. If he wanted to use his power for selfish ends, he could have not only come down from the cross, he could have defeated all of his enemies, he could have showed everyone, all of his enemies, who he really was, and said, I told you so. And he didn't. He submitted himself to death, even death on a cross. Look at the screen here with me, if you would. Why did Christ have to go all the way to death? Because God's justice and truth demand it. Only the death of God's Son could pay for our sin. So Jesus' answer in Gethsemane is, there's no other way. It has to be this way. This, this was your mission. Jesus' dying words quote Psalm 31, verse 5, where a righteous sufferer asks God for deliverance. It's a psalm by David. And uh, I encourage you to read it. It's in your Bible reading tracks. David prays for deliverance from enemies who are attacking him. They're seeking to trap him. They're causing distress, grief, and sorrow. And they make him a horror to his neighbors and an object of dread. And they scheme to take his life. Very appropriate for Christ who's dying on a cross. It fits him quite well. But as you read through this psalm and you see what all of these people are trying to do, Psalm 31 ends with praise as if the deliverance had already happened. The psalm ends as if the deliverance was already there. So it ends with a couple of verses that I have on the screen. Blessed be the Lord, for He has wondrously shown His steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Past tense. You heard. It's like it's done already. Jesus quotes this psalm. Is that a coincidence that it ends that way? Jesus' dying words anticipate His victorious resurrection. He's going out. He's passing away. And He is saying with confidence He knows what's coming. He told His disciples many times ahead that He would rise again. He knows He's going to rise again. And He goes out with His last words basically saying, I'm going to rise again because, Father, into Your hands I give My Spirit. And He will raise us up again. Blues singer Bessie Smith said her last words, I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. Harriet Tubman, who died in 1913, gathered her family around and they sang together. And her last words were, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Or there was a man who was burned at the stake for his faith named Roland Taylor. His last words, Merciful Father of Heaven, for Jesus Christ, my Savior's sake, receive my soul into Thy hands. Jesus died paying for our sins so that our dying words could anticipate eternal life. So one day, we will have some dying words to say. What will they be? Are you going to go out being afraid? Are you going to go out being disappointed? 
Are you going to go out just with some goofy response? Or are you going to go out saying, I'm going to rise again. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Or something like that. Let's not be afraid of death because Jesus was there and He rose again. And all of those who belong to Him will rise with Him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, we're so glad that Jesus Christ came, that He died, and that, Lord, You did not abandon Him to the grave, but, Lord, that You rose Him from the dead. And Lord, we put our trust in Your promise that one day our graves will be empty too and that with Christ we will rise again. And Lord, we look forward to that day when You will come again and death will be no more and all of this will be behind us because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross so that we can say, even with our last breath, some victorious words that Lord, You would rise us again. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.